Hello there, everybody. Today we're going to be designing, analyzing, and validating a part for aerospace usage because I don't know, why not? In a previous video, which I'll link in the description if you haven't seen it, I explained what a minimally constrained strut assembly was, what it's good for, and how to calculate the exact strut loads. I also mentioned in that video that I would design and validate one of the brackets to attach some of the struts to the primary structure, and well, here's that video. Because I'm generally not one that likes to hold things in suspense, here's the final bracket design, mounted on the structure and with all the struts. Here's the final stress margins, and at the end of the video, I'll be going through a review slide deck that I created to truly call this part validated. Anyways, this video is not intended to be a tutorial on how to do all this stuff. That would take many dozens of hours to get through everything, but perhaps rather a glimpse into a day or maybe a week in the life of an aerospace structural engineer. I will be showing all of the CAD modeling and analysis process, but in the interest of brevity, it will be greatly sped up. I recorded a total of about 10 hours of footage, and it's been condensed into 10 minutes or so. So we're going to start by setting up our design assembly file. I dropped in all the struts for which we're designing this bracket and rotated them so the bolt axis is perpendicular to the face of the mounting surface. From here, I added some extrusions for the lugs that will attach the struts. Then I made a base plate on the actual mounting surface. For the holes to attach the bracket to the structure, I'm using a pin slot hole technique to give a fully defined bracket position without needing tight tolerances. Anyways, if you've done any sort of CAD before, you probably know that unless you're designing aerodynamic or aesthetic surfaces, 95% of what you need to do can be done with sketches, extrusions, and fillets. Also, if it looks like I'm just an absolute machine that knows exactly what to do, it's because I've cut out a lot of portions where I just spin around the model for a few minutes and look at it from different angles and try to figure out how to proceed. Okay, you can see I've mocked out the basic shape of the part and now I open up a quick window to try to sketch the ribs and skeletonization I want to do to lighten the part. I'm doing this process as if, say, it's a week before this part needs to be installed in the vehicle and we've completely forgotten to design it. So I'm going pretty stout with the thicknesses, not really iterating too much on the design and pretty much entirely skipping optimizing geometry to get the lightest bracket possible. This optimization process is done fairly often in aerospace since weight is so critical in planes and space vehicles, but also sometimes this process isn't done, particularly when things are on tight schedules and instead the engineer's efforts are fully on validation and safety and optimization is a secondary concern. Okay, anyways, I was blathering on while the design was going on in the background, but here you can see we have the part fully designed and ready to begin analysis except for the fillets and root radii, which will come later. Now on screen you can see I'm doing a technique called mid-servicing to make a plate model. Plate modeling is a 2D meshing technique that allows the user to change the thickness of the elements and is used very widely throughout the aerospace industry. The benefits are significantly faster model run times and the ability to change part thicknesses without needing to remesh allowing for much faster iteration to reach positive structural margins without sacrificing accuracy. Okay, with the mid-surfacing done, you can see we've represented the entire part with just 2D surfaces, and we're going to import this into our analysis program. For this video, I'm using FEMAP with NX Nastran to analyze the part, a very common program in the aerospace industry. They actually have a license available for education, training, and non-commercial usage, making it a great program to learn industry standard analysis techniques without needing to spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars per month. We set up our material and property cards and now we're meshing the part with quarter inch thickness aluminum 7050 T7451. I'm going surface to surface, checking the mesh quality and making manual adjustments where needed. The more uniform and square the mesh is, the better. You can see the model is still 2D surfaces as you mesh it, but FEMAP has a setting that you can visualize the thickness if you want. With meshing complete, I begin the setup for our loads and constraints. To do this, I'm using Rigid Body Element 3, or RBE3, which is actually not rigid at all. It interpolates stiffness from the nose it attaches to and connects elements without adding any artificial stiffness. 
basically a bunch of nodes attached to a single central point that you can apply a load or spring or whatever to. Springs are used to represent the fasteners that attach the bracket to ground, and we can change the stiffness in each direction to get the pin slot hole set up properly. Next, I'm grabbing the unit vectors from the Python script made in the other video, dropping them in a load set, and selecting the node at the center of the lug to apply the load. To start, I just input 500 pounds on all the struts to make sure the model is working. Now, the moment of truth, surprisingly, the model ran. Most of the time, there's some sort of error or unconstrained node or unconnected element they need to fix, but I got lucky this time, kinda. One of the best ways to assess a model besides ground weight and element quality checks is to look at the deflections. Scale up deflections a few times and you can pretty quickly tell if the model is behaving as expected. And obviously, this is not correct. I had the orientation of the slot spring wrong. After fixing it, you can see the bracket is firmly planted to the ground and the deflections are all from the material itself bending. Now onto entering all the loads straight from the output of the Python script. I could have made a FEMAP API to automate this in some way, but meh, oh well. It probably would have taken me longer than to just manually enter it like I did. Now I've made an analysis set with all 26 loads, and after running this, it gives us 26 separate results outputs. We can determine the maximum stress across all load sets by doing an envelope command in FEMAP, and that gives us this final output. We're looking at von Mises stress here, which you can sort of think of as a way of combining shear and normal stresses in all directions to compare against the material yield and ultimate strength. And you can see things are looking pretty good. Lots of blue and green is definitely a good thing when you're on a tight schedule like this mock example. We have one problem region right here where the lug needs to be clearanced out for the fastener hole. The stress in this corner is around 50 to 60,000 pounds per square inch, which is just about equivalent to the strength of the material, but we want to hold a factor of safety of 2 on ultimate strength, so in reality we need to be below 32 KSI. I experimented with a few different things. You can see right now I'm trying to make this much larger rib, and I went through the process of creating a mid-surface version of that. Here's one of the benefits of a plate model in action. I can very easily splice in this rib and run the model within minutes. Unfortunately though, adding this rib just kind of pushed around the area of maximum stress without decreasing it much. So I thought, what if we just cut out this entire low thickness area altogether? Again, I didn't need to remesh it, just delete the elements I don't want, and look at that, it actually worked. Our stress is now 31.2 KSI, just barely below where we need to be, but hey, positive margin is still positive margin. In reality, we'd probably want a little bit of extra margin to protect against future changes or load increases, but again, this is on a tight schedule and also, well, just for a YouTube video, so I don't want to spend too long chasing this issue. Okay, with the finite element analysis all wrapped up, we can write the final stress margin, which you saw in the beginning. Also, in case you're unfamiliar with the concept of margins, it's basically how close you are to failure with the factor of safety already baked in. Greater than zero is good, and less than zero is bad. The other important aspect of the analysis is fastener and lug failure. For these, we're going to use hand calculations in the form of Excel spreadsheets. Here's the fastener one. This is actually based on NASA standard 5020, requirements for threaded fastening systems in spaceflight hardware. All NASA standards can be found online, so feel free to read through them at your heart's content. I'm not going to go through the math, but basically the user inputs all the joint information and loads. There's a big calculation section down here that calculates all the relevant failure modes. Then all that info is summarized in this margin table up here. Fastener loads are pulled directly from the model. Remember the springs we use to represent the fasteners? Well, we can have FEMAP output the XYZ loads of the springs, process the data in Excel to find max axial and shear forces, then drop that into our spreadsheet. Perhaps I'll do a video on bolted joints one day. They're much more complex and fascinating than they appear to be on the surface. Anyways, I also made a similar spreadsheet for the lugs to calculate all the relevant failure modes for breaking the lugs that attach the struts. 
And there we go, all positive margins. With the analysis done, let's jump back into SolidWorks and finish the part by adding all the fillets that I omitted before, as well as adding in the fasteners. For the fasteners, I was actually thinking of using highlight pins, which are pretty common in aerospace, but I realized that I hadn't designed the underlying structure to accept a pin install, so I just gave up and went with NAS 1351 socket head screws. Anyways, here is the final model, including the fasteners, bolts, bushings, and nuts. Let me know how you think it looks. Now, to actually get the parts made, we need to tell the machine shop how to make the part, which typically comes in the form of an engineering drawing. Nowadays, lots of companies do minimum dimension drawings where only the really important stuff is dimensioning called out and the gross acreage of the part is just controlled by a profile tolerance of the model. That's what I'm doing here. Some companies here and there have even started doing 100% model-based definition with no drawing at all, with all tolerances, materials, finishes, etc. stored as model data, but I've never personally done that. Anyways, the drawing layout is basically two sheets. The first sheet has notes that call out material, finish, part marking, and the profile tolerance unless otherwise specified. Note how in a few areas I called out a fake MB, aka MISC bits document. This would be company standards for doing routine things. The second sheet has all the dimensions I care about, so establishing the ABC datums, size and position of fastener holes, size and position of lug holes, blah blah blah. Of course, this drawing would be reviewed and approved by several engineers before it was released, but since this is a YouTube video, it won't. Well, perhaps it will be reviewed by all of you instead. Okay, that's the drawing all wrapped up. Now on to the final review. This review serves both as the chance for many engineers to see your work and make sure the part is safe, adequate, and ready for flight, but also as the final engineering documentation of the part. Additionally, it's customary for another engineer to audit your analysis model at a fairly deep level to make sure everything was done correctly. Again, since I'm the only engineer in this imaginary space program, we'll have to skip that part. Okay, I want to go through this review at lightning speed in the interest of time, so if you want to actually read and take in all the slides, you'll just have to pause. Let's get started. System and design. Design requirements. Another fake MB document and then a bunch of NASA standards. System level architecture, showing the context of the part on the vehicle. High level design, showing what the part is supposed to do. First design detail slide, showing the part as machined. Second design detail slide showing how it's fastened to the structure. Third design detail slide showing the lugs and the strut hardware. Tolerances and close clearances. I didn't show myself doing them on screen, but I completed tolerance stackups to make sure this stuff actually fits together. Materials, finishes, and masses, self-explanatory. Grounding slash EMI, basically how we're making sure the structure is all grounded together. The part is hard anodized, which is not conductive, so under one of the fastener heads, the area is masked before anodization. Manufacturing and integration flow. Okay, analysis time. Here's the margin summary table. Normally this table would be much, much larger since reviews typically are done on full systems and not just a small bracket. Loads, this is straight from the previous video, link in the description. Model overview, very brief details with a link for the reviewers to open the model themselves. Fem detail showing how fine the mesh is and how accurately it captures the real geometry. Constraints and boundary conditions showing how the model is constrained and how loads are applied. Materials and properties. As with most aerospace applications, I used MMPDS or Metallic Materials Properties Development and Standardization. You've seen this slide a few times, the von Mises stress margins, fastener margins, lug margins, fracture and fatigue. This slide is admittedly a bit hand wavy, but I think the explanations hold water. The part isn't fracture critical since the net section stress is less than half the ultimate strength, which is a real justification. Fatigue is verified by showing that the cycle count is less than the expected life at peak stress. Qualification. Qualification plan. This is just one slide and says that the part is qualification by analysis. The majority of space structures are qualification by tests, but NASA standard 5001 
does allow analysis only qualification if the parts are simple and well understood, which this is. Closing items. Schedule. This is made up for our scenario, obviously. Risk. None. And we're done. Obviously, real reviews are going to have much more content since, like I said, usually an entire system or structure will be done at one time and not just a single random bracket. For example, the entire tray system may be in one slide deck, along with all the brackets, struts, and the tray itself. Anyways, that'll do it for this video. Let me know what you guys thought. Hopefully you found this video interesting or useful, maybe as a glimpse into the life of a structures engineer. My last video about the Tomcat really blew up way more than I was ever expecting, so there's a lot of new people here. Thanks so much for subscribing and welcome. The next video will be an addendum to the original Tomcat video since people left a lot of good comments with new information and feedback. See you then.